Artisan Summit 2020 is coming soon. You're not going to want to miss this year. It's going to be epic. We've been asked over and over again, are you going to do it again next year? Because the people who came cannot believe how it changed their life, it changed their business, it changed their outcome of how they turned their craft into cash. Paul's Toolbox, he's a hero. He went to Hurricane Katrina as a firefighter, he saved lives, and he's on YouTube teaching the DIY community how to get things done. And he's the man, the myth, the legend, Paul Ricaldi. It was like 2013 when I really started pushing it. I've had checks like $5,000. YouTube. I didn't think I was gonna make anything off of it. I'm doing my son's bedroom, I'm renovating it. That video just started taking off. I could do nothing but maybe play jump rope with this thing. That's about it. We got a problem. Tell you, if I needed the pins, it was that morning. It was bad. I'm like, whoa, this is it. Remember, when you subscribe to our channel, click on the red subscribe button and be sure to ring the bell so you get notified every time we have a new video. Thanks again. I'm going to talk about our next speaker. When, uh, when our channel was very small, we had about 5,000 5, subscribers at the time. We got contacted by uh, Paul Ricaldi, Paul's Toolbox. I was completely starstruck because I've been watching Paul for, for a long time. And Paul had hundreds of thousands of people that tuned into his channel and his show. And here I am. He contacts me and he says, man, I love your stuff. I love what you're doing. I love your videos. And I was like, oh, oh, th thank you. Thank you. I was so scared. So I could, I was like, I couldn't, I didn't even know what to say. He completely changed our business. He shared with his community about our epoxy. He didn't need to do that. He didn't ask for anything in return. He just said, we're doing a good job. I like what you're doing and he did something with our stuff and never asked for anything in return. I, I couldn't believe it. So I learned that Paul is a hero. Paul, uh, during Hurricane Katrina, uh, was, was a, a, a man who went out and saved people's lives. Paul cares about everybody far more than he cares about himself. Paul gives brightness to the world. Paul knows DIY. Paul is extremely successful. He's a man that men want to be. His wife is just a little better than him, but he's Way pretty better. dang good, man. Way better. So without further ado, I introduce to you Paul Ricaldi from Paul's Toolbox. All right, you guys. Love you, brother. Love you, man. I just want to share a little bit of my story with you guys. Mike uh, asked me to come out here and do that, and uh, I didn't think anybody be interested but mine's a little bit different story so at least I have something it's just the reason why I got into YouTube was different than a lot of other people I didn't think I was gonna make anything off of it it wasn't for for trying to build a business I, ha I like to invent things I like to make things if people who've seen my channel I'll make I made certain jigs to show how to make cut crown molding easier and do different things I gadget I play with gadgets I came up with a theft device for cars back in 1996. Leslie and I had two kids um, struggling. I was working construction, she's a nurse. I came to her, I said, Leslie, I have an invention. I said, I know it'll make it. I, I've always looked to try to get something going. I wanted to get a patent on it. So I did. We invested all our savings, everything into it. And my attorney just did a bad job. Somebody stole it, ran with it. I saw it in Pep Boys every week. And you know, about a year later and I was, uh, really devastated by it. But two years later, y'all, I'm sorry about my throat. <clears> throat> I um, came up with another idea because I was working at Metairie Country Club. It's an exclusive country club right outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. And I'm building a big bar. And the funny thing is, it's a 20 foot bar made out of mahogany and I put epoxy on it. That was years, that was 1998. So when I'm building this bar, um, well, by the way, the epoxy is nothing like the epoxy he has. Nothing. I'll build this bar and I used to take my finger. If anybody does construction, you take your finger, you hold it on, uh, you'll mark your wood, you take your finger and you take a pencil and you just run down the wood and you'll get a nice line and you make your cuts. While I'm rolling through this, a splinter, splinters always get in your finger, but I got a deep one. And I got blood all over my mahogany plywood. I went home and I said, that's it. I had my finger all wrapped up. 
I come home, I get a torch, I put it next to the sink. I, um, I go grab some side, I had siding material and windows. I did every, all kind of work. Took some of the channel and uh, I cut it up and I'm melting it and I have a tape measure apart and I'm making it fit into here. Leslie thought I was crazy. She's like, what are you doing? I said, I got a new invention. I'm and she was like, no, no more inventions. I'm done with that. So I said, don't worry. I said, I'm gonna make this. I, um, I said, I'm gonna patent it. And she said, well, we don't have the money to patent it. We just spent $30,000 two years ago, you know. And I said, look, I just wanna apply for patent pending. So in those days, you couldn't look on a computer. I had to go down to LSU into the basement. They had microfilm. For days, you're rolling and you're rolling through things to try to fit, you know, find anything close to it before you try to apply for a patent. So I did. And uh, I started trying to get people to listen to me, which is very, very difficult when you don't know anybody. And, I'm, and at this time, I get hired on a fire department. 1999, I get on a fire department and I'm trying to get these places to listen to me. I have a patent pending in my pocket. I think I got something. Nobody wants to listen to you. Is it patented? No. Call me back when it's patented. And then, or do you have a product? You know, things like that. I uh, went around and this is my first little prototype. I went around, I made the instruction sheet, the whole thing, a little flyer to go in it, and I figured I can go to the hardware stores and I could sell them for maybe 75 cents, they cost me 40. I went down to stores all over Louisiana, and I worked two jobs. I'm at the fire department and I'm working a side job, so I did it every chance I got. I go to a different hardware store, and uh, I go to one of the places, I'm talking to him. There's a guy, I have to explain him a little bit to you, He's on every Saturday morning. He's an elderly guy. He has suspenders with, with um, tape measures on him. You know what I mean? And, and he's uh, Craig Lowe, super nice guy. He's the local guy that, that you, I'd watch all the time. So they said, Craig Lowe frequents this place. Man, I know him. And I was like, would, would you talk to him? They said, sure. So he says, give me your information. I'll give it to him. About a week later, Craig Lowe calls me. And I recognize the voice. Hey, is this Paul? Yes, sir. He goes, he says, uh, <clears throat> I saw you have a pretty cool little invention. He says, you're trying to get it to the market? I said, yes, sir. He says, look, come on down to the studio. I'll talk to you about it. I'm all excited. I tell Leslie, I said, I, 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 Craig Lowe wants to talk to me. I'm going to see him. So I go over to the studio. So I'm talking to him. He says, what do you have there, boy? And I said, well, I'm showing him a little bit about it. And he goes, he goes, you can do a demonstration on it. I said, yes, sir. I sure can. I said, uh, he goes, okay, good. You're going to be doing it. I said, well, when are we going to do it? He goes, three, two, one. Hey, this is Craig Lowe. <laughs> he starts talking. I'm like, I'm just sitting here like an idiot. <laughs> I tell you, if I needed the pens, it was that morning. It was bad. <laughs> so I did a demonstration. And in those days, you get a VHS. You know, that was, that was it. I got a VHS. Ooh. I only came home, put it in the VCR, showing my wife. I was all excited. Started trying to go talk to places. I had no way to get it to them, you know, and I'd go, I'd go try to get somebody to the show and they didn't want to listen to you. I said, well, I'm gonna go to one of these hardware shows, a national hardware show, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get somebody there. Cause these other companies are also telling me, why don't you get a company to pick it up? So that's what I figured I'd do. Flew out to Chicago, get a room, the whole thing. I go to the, I go through the, um, the aisles and I'm looking, I'm just, blown away by all the people with tools and everything that's going around. I'm a big tool buff. So another guy I talked to, he, he was a real nice guy. He said, look, he says, where are you from? He listens to my accent. I said, New Orleans. He goes, man, he goes, the guys with Swanson Tool Company, they sell levels, speed squares, they're big and lows. The owners of that, those guys are from, are from the West Bank or something. So I said, man, I know the West Bank. Well, I know the whole area. He said, let me introduce you to him. So he goes and introduces me to the vice president of Swanson Tool Company. We hit it off real well. But he, unfortunately, they don't deal with tape measures. And tape measures is a real tough market to get into. It's, there's a lot of parts in there that a lot can go wrong, and I found that out. But he said, man, I, 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 we, I can't help you with this, but I'll, I'll guide you along the way or whatever. And he helped me with a lot of things down the line. Well, I still didn't license it. Several, a few years go by, <clears throat> Katrina comes. I'm on a search and rescue team, <clears throat> and at the time, we were doing training up in Shreveport. This hurricane's out in the Gulf, or getting close to the Gulf. They said, when it hits the Gulf, we're going in. This search and rescue team's a volunteer thing. You don't have to go. And we're like, yeah, we want to go. That's what we train for. So 
We go into Baton Rouge, we wait till the winds got low enough to, to drive in. We go in there, we get up on this bridge, you see the bridge going across the dome. There's, there's a drop off where the exits are. So that's where we'd launch our boats. So we launch our boats, we go in here, it gets nighttime. All we have is a lamp on the front of our boat and we have no guns, we have nothing, two guys per boat. We're riding, we're going through, you don't hear a bug, you don't hear a peep, except for people screaming. You'd hear frantic screaming from people because crime was going rampant. Nobody was in the city. <clears throat> Police weren't in the city. You know, some of the New Orleans police, they had a lot of good ones, but some of them took the cars and left. They have a lot of good cops, though, believe me. A lot of them were there and stuck it out. It's just you always get the renegades. It was so sad. I'll go over to pull this, pull in this uh, <clears throat> house to get this girl. And she says, she's waving to us, and we said, we go over there. And she says, no, I'm not getting in the boat. She goes, there's a man over there. There's a man and a woman, and, and he's, uh, he's an amputee. He's diabetic. You got to go help him because the water's rising. We know it. There was looting and all going on in New Orleans while we're getting there, and like, these people don't even realize the water's rising. It's coming because a huge industrial canal broke and broke and was just push houses. We go over there to get this girl, and like I said, she sends us to this other guy's house. We go over there, and the lady won't answer the door. So we're like, look, fire department, fire department. It's pitch black. There's not a light in the place. We have a little lantern. So she starts, she opens the curtains and she sees us. She starts crying. She opens the door and it's an elderly lady. I said, <clears throat> I said, miss, I said, we're coming to get you. I said, we'll get you out of here. She said, my husband's, my husband's in bed and the water's up to the bed. He's in here and the water's at the bottom of the bed coming into the bed. You talk about people that have already seen hard times. He's an elderly black man who's already seen. He's probably 80 years old, so he's seen the worst of everything anyway before this. And he's thanking me the whole time and saying, God bless you, you're an angel. I'm like, no, no, you know, we're gonna get you out of here. So I had to break a door. We, I kicked the doorknob off of it. <clears throat> we take the door and set him on it because we don't have anything but a little skiff. Um, we get past Katrina, I'm gonna go past, I don't wanna dwell on all of this stuff, I just wanna tell you. We saw all kinds of stuff, but look at these houses. They're stacked on top of each other. Some of them were on top like this, just piggybacked. We get past, you know, Katrina, but I, um, I went back over, I do, um, we have to do recovery work after that. So they give us a grid. And we go through each house and we have to find out that there's a, a, there's a lot of people that are still missing. So we have to go try to find out if they're there or if they evacuated and we didn't even know about it. So when we go in these houses, we're digging through and you have asbestos, you have lead paint, you have every chemical in, under your sink and in your garage. You had the oil refinery that broke. So different things, you know, sewer, everything in the water. So <clears throat> when we clear a house, I didn't think about the time that all I had was a dust mask because this was volunteer. They'd tear down the house and poof, huge thing of smoke, I mean dust all over and you got all this lead paint. You don't even want to drill in a house with lead paint, but you're sitting over here breathing it, you don't even realize it. We get past this, I start getting sinus infections and start getting a lot of sore throats, stuff like that. It was April 17th, Leslie, 2008. I'm working. I worked two jobs my whole life, so I'm working. Swamped, because Katrina came. Everybody needed new kitchens and all, and I did kitchens and, um, you know, renovation work. And so I'm just going back and forth to work. I was, I was exhausted all the time, but I was just, just, while the money was there, I have kids. And, you know, we're trying to get ahead. We have the patent. The whole works. So I get a lump in my throat. <clears> throat> And I'm shaving, and I see it, and I was like, ha, huh. I ask her. I always go to the nurse, because she knows everything, and my son called her to the doctor. I said, what is this? It's a shadow. And she said, it doesn't look good. She goes, I want you to go to the doctor. I'm going to make an appointment. I said, I can't. I, I got, this was, like I said, April 17th. I said, I have too, too much on my plate. I said, I can't. I got to go to work. No. She already set the appointment up. So I go to the doctor Monday. He checks me out. Thinks it's a salivary gland. And uh, so he gives me medicine. He says, look, if it's not going down by Thursday, I want to see you again. I said, okay. So I'm, I'm taking it and taking it. Well, this thing starts growing out like a goiter. And I got a friend of mine in the fire department, my best friend. He's all, we always tease back and forth. Every time I look at him, I'm at work, and he's like, I can't look at you, man. You got a goiter on your neck. And I'm like, you idiot. I said, watch it be cancer. And you're, doing it, you're making fun of me. Well, it was. Turned out to be throat cancer. Um, 
thank God, uh, everything turned out. I had a lot of radiation treatments. I had huge amount of support from my brothers on the fire department and my wife, my kids, my family. It was tremendous. So you see, that was the first picture. Everybody shaved their head on the department on the first picture to, uh, you know, just to support me. I went down to about 130 pounds and uh, that was on close to my last radiation treatment. So we'll get past this. This was me when I was recovering and I had a lot of burns on my neck and my salivary glands are gone. So that's why I'm always with water if you see me and I'm sorry about me losing my voice a little bit. But I don't have, mine was just a misfortune and, and it's better and I'm not looking for sympathy or anything. I've had a lot worse stories. And that's how life is, you know, we, we move on. It was just me. My biggest worry was her and my kids. I just wanted to live long enough to get my kids to where they, they could handle themselves. I was worried. After I get past this, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite past this. This is like November. I'm still pretty much bedridden. So I had this other patent I couldn't get on the market. I said, I got to think of something else. I start drawing. I'm designing stuff. I come up with another design. And you guys will see it because both tape measures, we're going to... We have about 20 of them or whatever, 20 something of them we're gonna give away. <clears throat> so you can laugh at me and say, now I know why you didn't get it on the market. <laughs> but, but I couldn't get anybody to listen. So I made this other one and I come back and Leslie, I got another invention. <laughs> try, to, try to ask her for more money. <laughs> I'm like, we can do this, we can do this and all this stuff. So we start pushing it again. Soon as I got on my feet, I got a Dremel tool. I start grinding, I'm making this tool. <clears throat> well, I made it. So I went to the show. Before the show, I started trying to manufacture it myself. I get a middleman. This guy says, look, I live in the United States. I'm on the up and up. I get in touch with this guy. I start talking to him about it. I said, I got a tape. I send him the drawings. I have CADs all, all together. Send him the CAD drawings. Yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I can do this, this, and this. It'll be about $12,000 for the, the mold. I'll make the, I mean, I was talking other places like $40,000 for the mold for the tape measure. So he said $12,000, I can make the mold, the whole, the whole thing. So I gave him the $12,000, I was supposed to get so many samples. After I talked to him, I said, we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna go in the show next year. This is like eight months in advance. I said, I'm booking the show, you gonna have it? Oh yeah, I have it, no problem. I sent him stuff, he sends stuff back. I sent it, this is no good, send him stuff. And he finally, he sent me the pictures, everything looks good, I said, okay. At this point, I don't have time to, to check. I said, ship it to me. It's coming close to the show. I already got it booked. Paid for everything. Charged most of it. Had to borrow a second mortgage on a house to get the other stuff done. Well, next thing you know, it's like a few days before the show. I still don't have a tape. I'm calling him at the airport. I'm calling him here. I'm calling him there. I get to Las Vegas. He said, oh, it'll be over there at the hotel. I go to the concierge as soon as we get there. Man, do I have a package? It's coming from China. No. We have to go set up the booth. So I got banners, I got everything. The whole thing. I don't have one product to show. We set up and, and I'm getting in touch with him. He goes, oh yeah, go down to Seoul, this great wall or whatever. He says, go over there, they'll have them because the guys are setting up their booth and they'll do it. I said, okay, I go there. They're gone, everything's set up, they're gone. I'm panicking. Now, now I'm panicking. I'm not a guy that gets nervous. I was panicking. So we go over and uh, go back to the hotel. I'm calling him, calling him. Finally, I get him on the phone. And he says, oh man, he's gonna call you. I got in touch with him, don't worry, it's, it's, it's there. I said, okay. So the guy calls me, I go up, and meet him at a hotel. It's one of the rundown hotels. I'm like, this isn't a good sign. So I go over there, and I go uh, down the hall and this and that, and the carpet's nasty. And I knock on the door, he comes to the door, yeah, he barely speaks English. So he gives me a box. Yeah, and I said, okay, so I take it, go back to the truck, I open it up, I got this. Guys, this thing, if I gave it to you and you felt it, it's pitiful. I'm like this. I'm like, man, this, I don't, I'm, I'm playing with this blade. I'm like, it feels like spaghetti. I'm like, oh, God. I said, guys, I got to practice in the parking lot before we go in there. I got to try to cut something to see if it works. Well, I, I get my razor knife, put my finger on the end. You know how I, I told you we'd do with marking or cutting, and this one won't even open. So I got the piece on there. I go to cut, and this blade's doing all of this stuff. And, I'm like, I could do nothing but maybe play jump rope with this thing. That's about it. So, 
So I'm sitting over here, I'm like, well, I guess, I guess this is it, guys. We got a problem. So we go down to, to the convention center, and I'm panicking. I'm like, we got to get something. We're not going to cut the drywall. We're just going to leave that under the table. I'll mark lines. I said, guys, do anything. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it costs. Get me some tape measures. Get me a couple of tape measures. I need a blade. They go down. They tell somebody they're interested in the tapes, and they got some sample tapes. Bring them back. Me, I'm like, I'm like, give me one of the tapes. I'm under the table. I'm slinging this thing out, man. I'm like, I got to get it out of here. Give me another one. I, take, I said, hold it right there. He's holding it. I'm, I'm under the table doing this, and it's coming out from under the table. They're getting ready to open the place. People are waiting to come in. I was like, oh, this, this thing. I, I get two of them matched, and I got them in there. And I'm like, oh, good. I start reeling it back. It comes to about here. It won't reel because the spring's too weak. So I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, let's see. I, give me a screwdriver. They give me a screwdriver. I take it apart. I'm winding the, the spring up. I get it wound up, put it back on there carefully, get it back. I get it. It's great. But this is about as far as it's going to go out because I'm using the spring so tight. I said, nobody touches it but us. And I said, I'm not, I'm not showing anything else, just this. So we get in there and we start rolling. And believe it or not, we had a packed booth. When I tell you, people were all over watching me demonstrate this thing. I'm cutting drywall, I'm marking circles, I'm marking lines, and you'll see what I'm talking about after. I'm sitting down, <clears throat> I mean, I'm demonstrating, showing stuff. Well, next thing you know, somebody says, man, Chris Grundy's down, he's down the aisle. Well, Chris Grundy, I love this guy. I don't know if y'all know who he is, but he had cool tools. He'd show all types of different tools. The guy is one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. He comes down to the booth, I mean his guy, and he says, look, you guys, I really like what you're showing. He says, uh, would you like to be on Cool Tools? And I'm like, sure. But then I'm, after I say sure, I'm like, you, Mike, I start sweating bullets. I'm thinking, oh, God, I got to be on camera. So <laughs> a Craig Lowe incident again, you know. So he comes over, and uh, I sign the release. He comes over, and I tell the guys. I said, all right, guys, we're going to show. They're like, nope, <laughs> you're showing it. They back off. I'm like, okay. So I demonstrate it. And he's like, that's a slick tool. He says, let me see it. I don't want to give it to him. I don't want him to feel this thing. I said, look, Chris, this is just a prototype. We got him on order that, you know, this is just a cheap plastic and this and that. He goes, I, I don't care what that is. I want to see it. I want to feel it. So he does, and he, he did a great job of spinning it out and the whole thing. But, guys, it's still, it's such a long road. This is 1998. I told you I was trying to get this. So nobody's listening to me again and i have cool tools i have all this stuff so we uh i said i've got to do something else i've got to, I've got to get this thing out there youtube who would have thought youtube back then it wasn't as popular as as it is now but i said well you know what i'm gonna do some demonstration videos i'm gonna put it on unlisted i sent it unlisted the link to places and then when i started talking to people they're like oh, some people started getting liking it I got interest. Started working with some places. This is the camera I use. I spent $200 on it. And believe me, it was not a good video, but I just showed, I was too nervous to be on the camera, so I just put it down on the table and demonstrate what it did. But I showed these guys, look, and this is what you can do with this tape. So then I, uh, I said, well, you know what? That was pretty cool doing that. I said, I, I, I said I'm just gonna throw a video up. I'm doing my son's, son's bedroom, I'm renovating it. And I'm doing, putting crown. I said, you know what? A lot of people don't know how to do crown. I'm gonna show them how to do crown. And that video just started taking off. And it was just with my simple camera. I'm still getting paid by that video. Well, I just left it and asked, that was fun. So I did another video. Then I did another. And I didn't touch them. I didn't do anything with it. I wasn't trying to market. I'm trying to market my tape measure. All my energy is going to the tape measure. Swanson Tool Company. You know, we had changed numbers. Craig Alleman, the vice president at Swanson, calls me and says, Paul, we're going to do a crawfish boil on the West Bank. I'm going to see my family. You want to come out there? I said, sure, man. We go out there, just casual. Leslie goes with me. We're having fun. We're drinking a few beers. He goes, how's your tape measure stuff going? I said, well, I still don't have anybody listening, but I said, it's getting much better. I sent it. I, I put it on YouTube. I started sending it in places. And I had just done it right before that. I said, I'm getting some good feedback. He said, well, what you got? So I show him the video. He says, Damn, that's slick. He said, I'm gonna talk to Jimbo, man. We gotta do something with this. So Jimbo's the president, his brother. 
He calls Jimbo. 2014, we signed an agreement. They're making my tapes. All because of YouTube. And uh, that's why I would tell you my story's a little different. I didn't think I was gonna make anything. Well then, YouTube contacted me. I'm like, they're sending me a, a thing you wanna get monetized. You have enough subscribers and enough of views. And I'm thinking, well, I don't, I don't do anything with it. So I go back and look and then I fill up the paperwork. <clears throat> I said, yeah, I'll take it, I'll see what it is. I got a $400 check. That was my first check. I'm dancing. I'm like, ooh, I spent $150,000 on this junk. I got $400. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is it. So next thing you know, we're sitting over here with the, uh, I'm rolling on YouTube. I said, I'm making videos. Because if I can make 400, I can make 800. If I can make 800, I'll make 1600. I'm like, we could pay the car note. We could, you know, I'm staking all this stuff. Well, few years you know not I mean I just started doing it it was like 2013 when I really started pushing it I've had checks like five thousand dollars you know three thousand dollars sometimes if I don't do a lot of videos and I haven't been doing as many videos my father passed away three years ago and I spend a lot of time with my mom so it slows me down on that but it's worth it it's what you put into it if I want to and, and the great thing about that is I'm not pressured I can do my family things I can take care of my mom. I can take care of things. And I can still do this and squeeze it in and get videos out. But that's not it. I start getting sponsors. And now it's like Christmas every day, guys. I mean, I mean, I don't know when something's gonna come in from one of these tool companies. They want me to try something. With that said, I after that I went over and I uh get a call from, from Louisville, Louisville Ladders. So they call me up. He said, Louisville's, you know, asked us to find good people around, you know, people that, that like their tools and we're interested in you. I said, great. And he said, um, would you be interested in talking to him? I said, sure. So I'm, I'm all excited. Ah, oh, Louisville. So they called me back up and he said, this is like six months later. He said, we've narrowed you down to like 12, 10, 10 people on YouTube. And I'm thinking, yeah, they're not going to pick me. And he said, uh, one of them goes, well, Paul, uh, what can you do for Louisville? What can you offer? And I'm thinking to myself, well, well, you guys called me. I, I don't know. <laughs> so I tell them, I said, look, I guess I can tell you this. I said, I'm honest. I said, my subscribers believe in me because I don't lie to them. I'd be happy to look at them. I said, but I'd like to buy one. Let me test it out. I'll buy it. And if I like it, I said, I'll call you. I'll, I'll be totally interested in, in doing videos. But if I don't, I won't bash you. I just won't. You know, I'll tell you I can't use it. And they said, oh, okay, well, thank you. And that was it, the conference is over. And the communicator goes, thank you, Paul. I was like, oh, shoot, I blew it. I hang up the phone, I called Leslie. I said, I blew it, I blew it. She goes, she goes uh, well, what'd you tell him? I said, well, I told him the truth. I said, you know, if I like it, I'm gonna use it. She said, well, that's it, you did the right thing. I said, y you're right, I'm not gonna worry about it. Well, I'm at work at the firehouse. Leslie calls me and she says, Paul, I can't get my driveway. Cause there's two pallets there full of, full of ladders. <laughs> but I want to ask you guys something. How many of y'all, I mean, I, I, how many of y'all, it's probably everybody here messes with stone coat countertop material, right? And when you were talking earlier, Brian Gurry's going to tell you he had bugs, right? A lot of bugs. This is your magic wand guys. I started playing around with it, and I use stone coat all the time. I love it. I'm doing a sinker cypress table. It's coming out beautiful. But I'm also doing one for the firehouse, so I'm behind on stuff. I'm getting ready to come out here. All right, this is recent. I'm getting ready to come out here, and um, I'm panicking. I'm running late, doing all this stuff. I'm doing. I said, well, you know what? I'm gonna bring this table to the firehouse, and I'm gonna pour my coat there and show the guys because we're gonna be making a table at the firehouse for the firehouse. So I'll bring it upstairs get everything set up. I went and got my plastic because I want to cover it, you know, make sure I don't get any bugs on it. It's got to be perfect. I get over there and we, we pour it all out. Everything's beautiful. These guys are like, man, this stuff is like magic. I said, yeah, I'm fortunate. All of a sudden, boom, the AC comes on, plop, stuff goes all over it. I'm like, oh, shoot. And I'm pinched for time. So I, I take it home. I said, I'm I just scratched it, you know, I don't disregard it. And they're like, man, Paul, it didn't come out too good. And everybody's teasing me. I said, don't worry, it's going to be good. So I take it home. I'm pouring it. It's late at night. 
In Louisiana, we got mosquitoes, yeah, like alligators. They're all over. So, get everything ready. It's all perfect. I got my plastic. <clears throat> it came out gorgeous, all right? So, I turned the lights out, had my bug light on. I'm thinking, they're going to go to the bug light. One gets in between stuff, digs his way right into it. I'm like, oh, I said, told Leslie, I said, that's it. There's got to be a better way to get it out. You get them down deep and you're trying to dig them. You just do this. Brush, brushes come out, bugs come out, everything just comes right out. Nothing to it. Pro tip, baby. I think I'm over. Am I over? Are you ready for us to hand Yeah, let's stuff? give some stuff away, man. Right. Let's give some stuff away. Give it up for Paul, guys. Hi, right, my brother. Paul, man. I got to get you something. Hold on. I feel like Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and you get one, and you, you get, get one. <laughs> oh, yeah, guys, I totally forgot. When you do stone coat countertop material, which is what? The best, yes. right? When you mess with this stuff, you have to have your table level. I'm putting stone coat countertop material on, on a one-hour dry concrete, all right? I made some stuff from a bathroom. It came out beautiful. You can check it out. And, I, and I'm making it look like marble. I used to install marble and granite. And people would ask me, oh, I want, I want marble in my kitchen. I said, no, you don't. And they're like, oh, no, it's beautiful. I said, it's soft, it stains, it scratches, and you spend a fortune on it. Now, you can pour yourself a concrete top with this. It's super simple. Even I can do it. And you put stone, if you could do stone coat countertop material, which is not hard, you can definitely do this. Now you've got marble that's durable, you put it in your kitchen, and you can look at my video, you can put inlays in it. So you can design it to whatever you want, make something really cool, marbleize it, and, and it doesn't cost you a fortune because you're doing it yourself. And let me tell you, that's stone cold. I tell people, well, you can put a hot pot on this thing. You know, it's scratch, if it does, where after time get a little scratch, you polish it out, there's nothing to it. Especially if you're making it look like marble and you hone it. Right. So you don't even see the stuff. It's, it's, it's like killing everything. That's going to be some new stuff. I'm going to be showing on a lot of projects. So, um, Paul. Yes. I appreciate everything you've done for our channel. I uh, appreciate what you've done for our business. Oh, man. Thank you for coming out and trusting us man. and speaking for us, man. Can we get Dude, a picture? You're it. We're Chris, we need a picture right here, man. I can't drop this mic. Drop that mic. You got this. You got this. Baby. Yeah. Yeah. Paul's oh, Toolbox. Man. Check out Paul's Toolbox. Thank you, and guys. Subscribe.